Today's program will focus on population health management. The continued pressure to manage health care costs and maximize workforce productivity has caused employers to broaden their participation in population health management for their employees. Managing the health of a defined population requires attention to issues of access, cost, and quality. In addition to traditional work injury prevention and management programs, employees are expanding the services offered to employees to include health promotion, health behavior change, primary care, and other allied health services. Employers may contract with health plans with nice health care providers or with local health systems to design and offer health services that meet the needs of employees while achieving the goals of the employer. The program focuses on the understanding the needs of employers in managing workforce health and discusses how healthcare organizations can partner with and support employers in population health management. Topics to touch on in today's presentation are as followed. We will address current and future needs of employers related to managing their workforce's health and wellness. We'll touch base on healthcare organizations and how they can assist in meeting employer goals for expanding the access, improving quality, and managing costs as related to the workforce health. Successes and lessons learned from the field of industry medicine, occupational health, and population health management. How workforce health can be measured, monitored, and evaluated. And lastly, discuss the correlations and differences between population health management, value-based benefit design, pay for performance, and accountable care from prospective employers. Today's first presenter, Julie Willems Van Dyke, RN PhD, is Associate Scientist at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. Julie is an Associate Scientist and the Deputy Director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, founded County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Program at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. She has worked with numerous partners across the nation to use County Health Rankings and Roadmap tools to take action to improve the health of communities. Her research interests focus in the area of quality of community health improvement planning processes. Prior to joining the Institute in 2009, Julie worked in local public health for 21 years as a public health nurse, director of nursing, and for the last eight years as Marathon County's health officer. She also served on the Asperus Wausau Hospital Board of Directors and as an elected member of the Wausau School District School Board. Julie holds a PhD in nursing with an emphasis in public health leadership from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. She is a graduate of the Robert Wood Johnson's Nurse Executive Fellows Program in the National Public Health Leadership Institute. Our second presenter will be Dan Houghton, who's the Vice President of Managed Care and Strategy and Development for Hospital Sisters Health System. In his rather newly created position, Dan Houghton will lead development of managed care strategy for HSHS. He began his service in April 2013. As the lead, he will develop strategic partnerships with payers, design and create physician networks, create new and innovative payment structures, and ensure appropriate IT solutions are used to gather data needed for best practices in population health management and medical management. Prior to joining HSHS, Mr. Hooden served as Vice President, Contracting and Provider Services with Cigna Healthcare in Atlanta. From 2000 to 2009, he served the Southern Region Medical Center in Atlanta in roles of an increasing responsibility, and from 1993 to 1999 as Vice President, Managed Care for VHA Central, Inc. in Indianapolis. Mr. Hooden began his career in healthcare in 1985 at Providence Hospital in Cincinnati. He earned a Master of Hospital and Health Administration degree from Xavier University in Cincinnati, a Juris Doctorate from the University of Dayton School of Law, and a Bachelor's degree in Political Science from Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio. Our last presenter for the afternoon is Ryan Nellis, Vice President of Optum Analytics. Ryan has had the responsibility for working with health providers and payers in the Midwest as they prepare for population health management and and shared savings. Specifically, Ryan and team enable organizations to utilize their vast data assets, EMR, claims, financial, and administrative, to give them the intelligence and real-world data necessary to successfully move the needle in their populations. Focus on the best data opportunities to reduce spend, improve costs for patients, and maximize managed care contracts. Ryan has been his role for three years. He was an early member of the Humedica team that Optum acquired in January 2013. 
Prior to that, he worked at McKesson in their small practice provider division, and prior to that with General Electric, where he was responsible for sales of the company's enterprise wide electronic health record solution, Centricity. Ryan lives in St. Paul, Minnesota with his wife, Danielle. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Notre Dame. With that, I will talk, turn over the presentation to Dr. Van Dyke. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm really happy to be with all of you today, and my goal during the next 20 minutes or so is to really lay the foundation of population health. Um, the work I'm going to describe comes um, out of my partnership with incredible partners at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who fund um, much of the work I'll be describing, um, our team here at the University of Wisconsin, and numerous partners throughout the nation. So today, um, as I said, I'm going to lay the foundation for much of the content that, that Dan and Ryan will be following up with some more specific examples and ways of applying this thinking around population health in your settings. So we'll talk a little bit about what population health is, um, what are the driving forces for population health management and improvement, and some opportunities for action, including some tools that are available to you all through the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program. So this model of population health comes from Evans and Stoddard, two Canadian researchers, and was published back um, in 1994. Um, and so one of the things I really want to emphasize as I speak with you today is this whole concept of population health is relatively new. This is considered one of the landmark studies around the multiple determinants of health, and as you can see, it's only 20 years old. So if you look at this picture of health, in the middle you'll see that interaction between disease and health care. And prior to really thinking about multiple determinants of health, that's really where we focused. If you got sick, you sought health care. Health care hopefully made you better, and so you'd move to that box to the left back into health. And we didn't think very much about what preceded or followed that interaction um, prior to the development of many of the models of the determinants of health. But what we've really learned is that, as you can see in this model, um, there are um, other influences, the social environment, the physical environment, our genetics, and our individual response, our health behaviors, and um, our own biology that all have an important influence on health. Um, about 10 years ago, my colleague here at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. David Kindig, um, did some work with uh, Greg Stoddard of the Canadian team and really uh, simplified the model in many ways to really think about, therefore, if all of those different things are influencing health, we need to think about programs and policies that influence those health factors that ultimately decide how long and how well we live and really started us in the U.S. thinking about how do we focus on the health of groups or individuals. And a little bit later, uh, colleagues here at the University of Wisconsin flushed that initial thinking of Drs. Kindig and Stoddard into what is now known as the County Health Rankings Model. And I think as you look at this picture of health here, you can see, again, it's the responsibility of each of us in the community, not just public health and health care um, partners, but partners that influence each of those four key areas that you see in the blue boxes, um, groups and communities that influence health behaviors that influence access and quality of care, but also that influence those important social and economic factors, such as um, business, education, community safety, neighborhood development, all which have an important influence on, as you see in the green bars, how long we live and how well we live. And then finally, also the physical environment, the quality of the air we breathe, the water we drink, the housing we live in, and how we will be able to connect, um, to get from place to place using our transportation system. I think one of the critical pieces as we think about population health is we think about who is the population. And this is an area that I think is really important as you consider 
working with a population. One of the populations that Don mentioned in the in introduction was the population of your workforce. That's one population. In healthcare, we often think of the population of the patients we serve, perhaps the patients of an individual clinic, or maybe within a clinic setting, patients with a specific diagnosis, such as diabetes or asthma. But when you work with practitioners who work in the community, for example, your public health practitioners, they may define population very, very differently. And they may be defining population as everyone who lives in the community. And it is not that either of these definitions of an aggregate group or the whole community are right or wrong. They are just different ways of defining population. And as you move into this work, it's really important that you be very clear in discussions around the work you are going to do to influence population health that you're clearly defining who your population is because it will affect how you use data, how you measure your progress and success, and how you select policies and programs to influence them. Now, we know there are many things driving um, population health management and improvement now. Certainly, the uh, Affordable Care Act has had a strong influence in many, many different ways. As I work with hospital partners, certainly there's a requirement here that now moves not-for-profit hospitals into thinking very explicitly about community health needs assessment and impl implementation plans to support the expenditure of their community benefit dollars. We know that changes in payment um, may affect this in terms of how we pay for health versus illness. We know that many of the requirements that um, CMS is putting in place, such as uh, penalties for readmission um, and other outcomes, are changing how we're thinking about population health. Our colleagues at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement have been helping us think about this for quite a while and focusing on the triple aim, of which one of the three corners of the triple aim is population health and how important that is to be coupled with looking at issues of cost and the patient experience. We also know from work that our colleagues at the Robert Wood Johnson Fund Foundation have done in terms of, of surveying physicians that clinicians know that the multiple determinants of health influence people's health. Um, as you can see from the survey that was done several years ago, that four out of five primary care physicians who were surveyed indicate that unmet social needs are directly leading to worse health for everyone and that physicians feel like they don't have the resources they need to be able to address those social needs that their patients are facing. And if they could, they would write prescriptions for things like fitness programs, nutrition, employment assistance, adult education, and housing assistance. So as I look at that and I think about what our clinician partners are saying about what they need, in order to improve the health of the lives of their patients, it brings me back to this model and thinking about what we need to do as people who work in a hospital, in a business, in a school, in a university, in a chamber of commerce, how we all need to be thinking and working together and aligning that, our work so that we are both working on the health of the whole community, where our employees come from, where our future work, workforce comes from, where our future patients come from, and also targeting that work to very specific populations. So how do we do that? What are the tools and resources that might be in place for you to think about how you frame work in your local community to think about either that aggregate population group, which, again, my co-presenters will be discussing further, or how do I think about the health of my whole community and what I can do to improve that? So I really like this model, the social ecological model, that helps us think that this is like the many layers of an onion. And so you can think, as you, as you say, as you look at data in your community and think about what might be the highest priority. Perhaps in your community um, it might be a high rate of smoking. I think in almost every community that's on this call right now, the issue of obesity is facing your population. 
um, the best performing communities in our nation have a 25% obesity rate, and we all know that's just unacceptable. Or perhaps in your community, it's issues of economic development and employment and education. Maybe your high school graduation rate is very low, or you have a high unemployment rate and you need to be working with partners to think about how we bring sustainable businesses into our community to provide good jobs. Whatever the issue is that you're working on, be it improving education rates, to, reduce, to improving healthy eating and active living, to reducing tobacco use, use, to be effective, we need to think at each ring in the social and ecological model. So what can we do to help individuals make better choices? What can we do to support families in making better choices? What kind of policies and programs and systems changes can we make in our own organization, our workplace, our hospital, our school to make, um, to address a priority issue in our community? What can we do in the community, in neighborhoods, in um, other uh, anchor organizations in our community, such as our faith communities, our YMCAs, our government buildings, and what can we do at a public policy level? Are there things we should be doing with local ordinances or state law to support healthier uh, environments for people in our community? Many of you have probably seen this picture of how we might think about approaching this. This comes from the Center to, for Disease Control and um, was originally authored by the current director, Tom Frieden. And what this illustrates is if we really want to think about influencing those factors that most affect health, we need to look at changing environments and changing those social and economic factors, um, which will have the largest impact on health, um, and recognize that the more time we spend simply in counseling and education or in clinical interventions, while very important in the moment, will not have as strong an effect on influencing the broader goals of longer life and healthier life in the total population. So it's a little bit different way of thinking about those different levels and thinking about where we target our efforts. So as we think about that model of health, here is a common theory of change cycle that in the middle you can see, again, all of those critical sectors who need to work together with our community members to first assess the needs and resources in your community, pick priorities to focus on what's important, choose effective policies and programs, implement or act on those um, uh, policies and programs that you've selected, and then continuously evaluate your action to make sure you're making progress. One of the places you can find a variety of tools and resources to support that type of action in your community is the county health rankings, um, and, which can be found at countyhealthrankings.org. And at countyhealthrankings.org, you can go to a map that illustrates the health of your community. I happen to be showing the Illinois map since that's where our sponsors are from. And in this map, you can see that the counties that are pictured in white or the lighter colors of green are the healthier counties in Illinois based on that model of length of life and quality of life. And the counties that are in the darker green are unhealthier. So in a picture, it very quickly starts to show where you live, where your hospital is, where your business is. It gives you a picture of the context of health in your community. This report is available for all 50 states, so if you go to countyhealthrankings.org and scroll down to the map, you, if you are from Colorado or Oregon or New York, you can just click on your state and um, get to the same uh, ranking and data information I'm demonstrating for you from Illinois. If you want to see about the health factors, those measures of health behaviors, clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment, you can see um, um, you can see the map and how it displays again with the same color coding for healthier is lighter and unhealthier is darker. And as I didn't mention earlier, over on the left-hand side, you can see the ranking from the healthiest to the unhealthiest in your state. 
If you click on any one of those counties, either on the list on the left or on the map, you then get to what we call the county snapshot. And while I know this picture is a little um, blurry on the screen before you, if you go to the website, you can quickly see this is where you go to all of the individual measures that, that uh, we use to calculate the rankings. You can find the data for your county, uh, a column that indicates the trend for many of those data elements, the error margin or the 95% confidence interval for that particular measure, a comparison to the top U.S. performers or where the 90th percentile of all counties are in the United States, and then finally a comparison to the state mean for your state. And then in the final column, the ranking for that county out of the counties in your state. So you can see that Champaign County, Illinois, ranks 23rd out of 102 counties in Illinois for health outcomes but a little better for health factors, 12th out of the 102 counties. And as I always say, I'd much rather be higher on the health factors because those health factors are predicting what will happen in the future and how healthy your county will be moving forward. And if you scroll down the page, if you're on the website, you'd continue to see the data for each of those four health factor areas in clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. So here is one easy to access, readily available data tool that's available to help you begin to assess, and I emphasize begin to assess the health of your community. On the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps website, we have a number of tools and resources to help you with each step in that action cycle, including um, places to find lots more local data about your community. Another important tool I just wanted to point out quickly before I wrap up and hand it off to Dan is a tool called What Works for Health. And so if you want to know what to do about health, either in your work site, your hospital, your community, um, what do we know about what are the most effective strategies? So what we have done at the University of Wisconsin through the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Program is we have done a literature review on each of those key areas that you see in the blue boxes of the health factors. So for example, in tobacco use, in diet and exercise, alcohol use. So if we um, clicked on quality of care, we would be delivered to a page that would show us different policies and programs around quality of care, and you can see we've rated the evidence. Some of these are scientifically supported, some with some evidence. And then if you click on any given program, in this case, medical homes, we show you more information about um, what we have discovered through searching the research about medical homes, what are the expected beneficial outcomes, the evidence of effectiveness, and if you're on the website, it also discusses um, implementation resources. Who are some of the people who are doing medical homes and what are some of the resources you might take in advancing that work? So it's all about acting. And so I know this is a rather busy slide, um, but I know the slides will be available. What I've done here is taken that model and shown you um, two examples in each of the health factor areas from what works for health. One, an example of community action, programs that you may uh, deploy in your community. And second, a community or a, a list of examples from healthcare, areas that would be more aligned with what you may be doing out of a healthcare organization to um, take action in each of those given areas. And um, I'm hoping that the slides will be available to you upon conclusion of the program. If the slides are available, each of these are a hyperlink to the actual content and what works for health, and you could learn more about each of them. But I'm hoping displaying it this way helps you see if I'm working in my community, I may want to work on a program such as clean indoor air policies if I'm focusing on tobacco use. If I'm working in a healthcare setting, a reminder system for tobacco cessation may be most helpful.
So as we come to the conclusion, here's another example from obesity going back to that social ecological model of ways you might take different programs to focus on the individual, the family, the institution, the community, or the policy. And I hope that this information will be helpful to you in your community. Some of the ways you can use it is we have heard from folks that this model of health has really helped guide their processes. The tools and guidance that are available on the Action Center are useful to many, many folks throughout the nation. And through the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps website, you can find a community of learning where you can find stories and examples of other communities that are on this journey um, towards health. Um, in closing, here's one way that a healthcare system, health partners out of Minnesota, used this model. They took each of the four health factor areas and they thought about what areas were central to their mission. So, for example, they're a healthcare system. All of the areas in healthcare are essential to their central to their mission, and they have high control. In health behaviors, you see it's central to their mission, but they share capabilities and control with others. And in social and economic factors and environmental factors, that's aligned with their mission, but they have limited capability and control. So they know that they must partner with other entities in order to focus on those areas. And so they took those two areas, they, they flushed out each of the areas in the model more, they thought about where they were working on things, and thought about where they were targeting some of their charitable giving and resources around initiatives in the community to drive those efforts. So I know that was a quick example, but I thought it was helpful to see from another healthcare system how you might take this view of population health and start to think about how the work you do, both within your organization and investments in your community, can help support community health. So I know we'll have further time for questions at the conclusion of all three presentations, but that wraps up my remarks. And at this point in time, I will turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Julie. And. and uh, <coughs> And I'm going to go ahead and talk about the market and why we need to be making some of these changes, as well as um, some responses, and then what we as providers can do. And on slide 43, I will focus on the first couple of bullet points, which are that healthcare expenditures continue to rise. And where else but healthcare in the United States can an aggregate of an 8% increase on an annual basis be considered a slowdown and a good thing in, in the rise of expenditures? Uh, and that's one of the articles that I was just reading a few days ago about the expected increases on the exchange under ACA for 2015. But when you read behind the headline, in one state, for example, one plan is going to reduce their premium by 6.5%, but in that same market, a separate plan is raising it by more than 20. So we're starting to see some wild fluctuations, and everybody is getting squeezed in this environment. And Modern Healthcare just had a big article on the reductions in reimbursement we're seeing around the country. So we as providers are especially getting squeezed. The other points on this slide are things that I'll talk about in more detail, starting with the changes from fee-for-service to risk-based or value-based contracting. And this is a nice graphic uh, representation of the decline in fee-for-service that we're starting to see in some of our larger markets. And when you consider the Medicare value-based contracting by 2015, 6.5% of the reimbursement is going to be at risk. You either make the grade and keep it, or you don't make the quality grades and you lose, based upon the measures you don't need, up to 6.5% of the Medicare reimbursement. I expect Medicaid to follow in some areas where they don't go to manage Medicaid, that same pattern, and the commercial plans as well. When you look at what's going on in terms of volumes, 
This is some information from the greater Chicago area, Cook County specifically, and then the entire Metroplex, about the reduction of volume overall in patient utilization. You can see when you start getting to 3% year over year, that's pretty significant in Cook County. At the same time, we're seeing volumes decrease and revenues go down. The insurance companies are having banner years. Some of that is pure health care. Some of it is consolidated basis. Uh, United has spread out its risk very nicely with other acquisitions. Cigna, a lot of their business now is overseas. And what's not listed here is that the Illinois Blue Cross Blue Shield Company, which operates in five states under its parent, has just been sued because it's still a co-op and its members want some of the billions they have in retained earnings. So while more than a third of the hospitals in Illinois today are in the red, the insurance companies are still doing okay. Uh, and as Julie pointed out, a large part of our problem is our obesity. And simply by eating healthier, exercising, and quitting the smoke, we could reduce a lot of the chronic conditions that eat up so much of our money today. So what are we doing to respond? I've already mentioned what CMS is doing and with their contracting on value and the penalties that they have. Commercial plans are also seeking reductions in the reimbursement. They're tightening their networks. Uh, we now see United, for example, is downsizing its physician network across the country, eliminating 8 to 10 percent of the physicians in a very systematic approach across the country, market by market. We're seeing shifts to tiered and narrow networks, especially in larger communities. And uh, we're seeing an amalgamation of the providers into larger and larger systems which payers are contracting with. And the gap between the commercial and government reimbursement is narrowing. There are dozens of slides just like this one out there on the reimbursement alternatives that are going from fee-for-service on the left all the way to capitation on the right. Value-based purchasing and bundled payments, they sort of blend together, as do shared savings and global payments. You see mixtures of both in many of the arrangements that people are talking about across the country. There's some examples across the bottom of some details of, of how those work, withholds, bonuses under value-based contracting, um, episodic payments and bundled payments for under the bundled payments, and then per member per month, uh, care coordination fees under shared savings if you hit a agreed upon medical loss ratio, uh, so you get a, a percent of the premium savings all the way to the capitation. Now, Avalier put this together and uses it across the country. And one of the things to take away, this is what Medicare is doing, and Medicare today is the leader in value-based payments although their focus is on you earn your way to the total dollars uh, that is under the fee-for-service reimbursement rather than bonuses or a percent of the premium. Uh, the commercial plans are beginning to follow some of Medicare's leads. They're looking for options to, uh, or other ways to promote value-based payments. And so it's going to make this world very interesting over the next couple of years. I really like this slide. This was uh, used in a presentation by Joseph Swedish, who's the CEO of WellPoint. Um, in fact, he used it at Modern Healthcare's virtual conference in October of uh, last year. That's where I picked it up from. And one of the things that I took away from looking at this and listening to his remarks is that WellPoint is looking for large physician practices to work with. 
and you'll see a lot of this is built around physicians. Uh, and, and that is their focus. And when you look at this compared to uh, the earlier slide that I was talking about, you'll see that this moves from bundled payments uh, very quickly to global payments without a shared savings component. I thought that that was interesting in the way they put it together. So the responses. To me, the two basic strategies. You can align with what the payers are offering, or we can put together models that we think meet the needs of the community better, as some of what Julie was showing you earlier uh, from some of the specific examples of how one system looked at their mission and how the things they needed to do align with the mission and they started taking donations and aligning it that way, we can sell alternative models to the payers. Today's open environment, I think, is a case of if you build it, you can sell it. But everybody's looking for the answer and nobody knows exactly what it will be. So if you don't compete on value, you will be competing on price. And I've been talking about the payers are coming and looking for a reduction in, in that fee-for-service rate. That's going to make it very difficult to compete on a fee-for-service platform. So population health becomes the key to value-based contracting, whether that's full risk, partial risk, whatever the form may be, and being successful. And not all the payers are going to look to us to manage risk, because if they do, they become an administrative company, and having just left Cigna, while at Cigna, we build ourselves as a health services company, not an insurance company. A fine distinction, but Cigna had already seen that writing and had moved heavily into administrative services only, catering to the self-insured market where the risk was held not by Cigna, but by the employer. I think other companies who are taking risk today are looking at how to download some of that risk in a volatile market. This is going to be a difficult transition. Many of us will remember the 90s when a lot of hospitals started their own HMOs, and a lot of hospitals just about went out of business over those HMOs before they could sell them. We lost significant amounts of money taking on the insurance world in a limited market. In fact, Coventry, which is now a part of Aetna, that's how they built their national network. They would come to stressed provider-owned HMOs and gobble them up around the country. And that was a really good model to build a national network quickly. The provider networks, whether HMOs, narrow networks, or shared risk relationships, are seen as uh, are providing more market share. They're a volume generating tool for uh, for hospitals. That's one of the problems we had with running HMOs. So we need good systems to process risk and manage it, focusing on the physician outcomes and not just the volume that they may bring to a hospital. You've got to focus at the physician level and focus on the outcomes, knowing that you're going to reduce volumes into the hospitals if you do this right. It's like having one foot in two different canoes going down the rapids. So one of the things that, that we've seen under the triple aim is reduce cost, improve quality, improve patient satisfaction. But if you look at the value proposition here, all of this is cost-related. Cost is the big thing that grabs the attention and grabs the headline. If we can improve the quality and the member experience at the same time, that's good. But what we've got to do in a stressed economy is focus on the money. 
So how do we make it happen? Some quick points to make. We've got to understand what is the population. Who is it? Is it a small defined population such as what we have in a contract with an insurance company or we have in Medicare? Or is it everybody in the community? What are you building? Stratification. How do we look at them on the risk compendium, on the continuum? Are they high-risk chronic illnesses? That's one intervention. Are they overweight or obese but haven't been seeking a lot of health care yet, but they're also a smoker, which means they will be seeking health care services shortly? And how do we do an intervention now to squeeze the pipeline of new patients? Because if we just get better at treating the, the chronically ill and the sick and don't close the pipeline, we'll have a one-time savings as opposed to something that we can generate long-term. So the IT guys love this slide because a lot of what we have to have is built around information technology. I think Ryan will be able to talk to this a lot better than I can, and any IT person that you want to talk to can explain this very well. But this gives you a really good view of optimizing IT and, and what needs to happen. Accountable care, uh, there are lots of models like this out there. And the, the part that I try to focus on is that at-risk population. In this bucket, I always use myself as the example because I'm overweight. I'm not as overweight as I was a year ago. I'm down 18 pounds, and I've kept that off for most of this year. And I can see where I'll no longer be clinically obese and just back into the overweight. And hopefully by the end of the year, we'll come to that point as well. So I started to take into account the changes that need to happen in lifestyle so that I don't fall into that acute episodic or worse, the chronically ill. For the chronically ill, there are some great intensive medical home programs that are being put together that focus just on those and are doing some wonderful things for the catastrophic. You treat them in the acute setting that we've been doing for decades now and are excellent at, a world leader. And under the ACO model or the patient-centered medical homes or any of those other compendiums of how to look at population health, we can start to address the first three to four boxes and move everybody slightly to the left, and it only takes a very minimal shift to see huge savings in meeting the triple aim. And when you start to move people to the left, you'll find the quality of the service is better and the patient satisfaction is better, thus meeting the entire triple aim. With this, I wanted to give Ryan enough time to be able to go through his presentation. So, Ryan, I'll turn it over to you now. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, so, as mentioned, I'm, I'm Ryan Nellis. I am a uh, vice president with Optum. Prior to that, I was with um, a company called Humanica that um, Optum acquired. And I think we've seen several slides like this. And I know Dan mentioned it with his canoe example. And I think, you know, a lot of providers are, are feeling this way. And, and um, if you think about sort of the purpose of this um, uh, presentation today to to talk a little bit about what um, providers are doing with employers. Um, I think some of the questions I thought you guys might have are, you know, what are some real world tools providers are using to help employers and specifically focus on employer populations? What are some of the challenges that they face, particularly from a data perspective? Um, if you get past some of the data challenges, you know, what are some of the reporting analytics risk stratification that folks are using? And um, it wouldn't be quite a population health discussion in this day and age without some talk about predictive modeling. So um, I think these are some of the questions I plan on going through. And, and I think just before I start, I think, you know, when you think about an employee um, or an employer working with a health system, 
I think Dan touched on this a little bit. A lot of folks are, are starting to work with large employers in their locales um, to focus with an employer on how do we lower the spend of the cost of the employee population. And a lot of what they do with those employees from a health system perspective is very similar to how they treat um, other patients and other health plans or contracts and things. So um, some of this discussion is going to be a little more global around population management, uh, but some of the real-world examples I'm going to show you are focused on an employer population. So let's start with the fun stuff. Um, big data, right? Um, everybody talks about it. And before we sort of jump in there, I think uh, a lot of folks would realize or, or, or think about that we're in this sort of golden age of predictive analytics. This is an example um, from Nate Silver on his using of large, massive amounts of polling data to predict the last election. There's other examples of this um, in healthcare prediction. I think the last hurricane um, that was hit was predicted within a several mile radius of where it actually hit. So lots of examples around the country. And I think when you think about healthcare, we've got a lot of data. And when you think about data, I thought we used some fun examples here. Um, things like, you know, how many Twitter followers does Justin Bieber have? What does that have to do with healthcare? No, I just want you guys to start thinking about data and, and just to think about how much data there is out there. So I'm going to actually build this slide out. Um, and, and so I, I do work for Optum, so um, I had some examples from our database. This is actually a couple months old, but when you think about how much data we have, this is data that's being processed on a monthly basis in the yellow compared to some of the other things. So I think the, the net of this is a whole lot of data. It's not just hundreds of millions, it's billions. And, you know, um, it com comes from places all over the country, and it, it helps us really do some really powerful, impactful things. Um, and these are some examples of some of the folks that contribute data to this massive warehouse. Um, and, and I think before we sort of jump into all this data, thinking about the challenges of that data is really important. And, and when you think about managing the health in a certain population or a narrow population, like a local employer's employees, it's important to think about why having the right data is so important. And this is just one example that looks at data and, and data sources particularly. So we, we looked in our database, and there's actually about 22% of diabetics undiagnosed. And when we studied the comparative effects of certain things on the undiagnosed diabetic population versus the diagnosed or coded diabetic population, we found that that smaller 20% of undiagnosed diabetics were actually consuming the majority of quote-unquote bad resource consumption versus good resource consumption. They had um, much more um, hospital visits, length of stays, and ED visits compared to their sort of coded peers, and a lower amount of, quote, good utilization in terms of proactive ambulatory care and ambulatory resource utilization. And when we talked to folks um, about why they thought this might be the case, um, it was because a lot of folks realized that if a patient or an employee doesn't have a code, um, they, they tend to not be outreached to, and they tend to not be put in sort of care programs and reached out to. And, um, and so there's lots of other corollary things, but I think the point of this slide is to show that, you know, we have to start with good data. And most folks, moving to the next slide here, have talked about this, and I know Dan had a slide similar to this, that focuses on sort of you know, where do you spend your time and with, with which patients do you spend your time? And if you look at sort of the right-hand side, the 80% of cost bracket, and you think about all the data sources we have in healthcare, um, claims data, payer claims data, um, drug data, lab data, electronic medical record data, of all sorts of kinds, they can all be brought to bear to help you reach patients sort of where they are. But if you use just claims data, um, you're seeing the folks that are sort of using services actively on the right-hand side. And the name of the game is to help use all your different data sources to find folks before they kind of cross that chasm. Um, so folks are in situational risks like uh, in a certain demographic, um, that boosts their risk score or they've got a family history of disease or early risk, they've come in for some visits and, you know, they've got some elevating levels of, of certain things or, or high risk, um, lots of different combinations in their data identify them to um, a predictive model that um, gives folks uh, area of opportunity and intervention before they may jump into this cost bracket. Um, 
so this this sort of begs the question: How do I how do I harness all my different data sources as a provider? So if I'm working with a local employer to develop a narrow network, or I'm in a value-based contract of any kind, how do I focus all my data sources um, to help me find patients and build intervention programs around the patients that we want to reach out to? And I think um, as I've talked to folks over the last several years, you know, most folks are trying to do the same things. They want to know where they spend their time from a quality improvement perspective, how they compare, and really where they ought to be spending their time, not necessarily on the patient that's in front of them right now, but who's going to be coming in and what can we do proactively and preventatively. Um, and, And folks often tell me, hey, you know, there's really four big challenges, and this is after a long discussion, but I think the four are data are in different places. Healthcare data is, is kind of all over the place. Um, and, and in each silo, the data is um, not sometimes, but typically always called into question. Providers don't want more data. They actually want less data, but they want more valuable and useful data. Um, and then they need tools to be able to help them sort of use that data. And so I'll show you guys some examples of, of this as we get through here in just a minute. But I think when you when you start to figure out how to tackle these four challenges, we have to get data from all our different data silos. So lots of organizations have multiple different EMR systems, standalone laboratory systems. They've got other databases of valuable patient data like Social Security death index information or socio-demographic data or claims data. They need to bring that all together in its raw format. Um, Once that data is all together, that data typically tends to be messy and inaccurate and have multiple duplicities. We see um, men having babies, 3,000-year-old people, uh, daffy duck test patients often pop up. And when you think about providing a a care team, a doc or a nurse, a list of high-risk patients, any any of that data is just going to immediately skew the results. So you have to have clean data. Um, And it's not just about kind of kicking out the easy stuff. It's tackling the data documentation challenge. So if you were to look for a intervention opportunity, like show me all my patients who have CHF but are not on an ACE or an ARB, um, this is an example from an EMR database that shows that docs are per the way they're documenting a prescription can sometimes be north of over 50 different ways. And so to answer that question quickly, somebody has to go in and find all those different ways and normalize that and, and document that. The other challenge is that a lot of the data are just not in a discrete data field, some very valuable data. So um, if you really want to start using all your data assets, um, physician notes are, are one of them. And there's technology called natural language processing that could be used to go into uh, dictated or transcribed text-based notes and pull out and create very discrete and uh, valuable data fields from that. So once you get all of your data from your different sources into a single place, it's been mapped, normalized, cleansed, that's where the real sort of fun can begin, but also the real work. So when you think about, you know, where do we spend our time using all our different data sources, there's lots of... Um, predictive models that can be employed, lots of gaps in care reports, um, benchmarking that shows you maybe before we start working on our population where we're doing not as well compared to our peers, maybe where we ought to spend our time, Um, and then using a a sort of tool um, to augment your electronic health record from a population perspective. So um, when I talk to folks about, you know, what do we need to do if we're focusing or working with an employer um, to be successful. You know, if you sort of put your business cap on a little bit and you look on the left-hand side of the screen, one of the things the employer wants to do is really work with you to manage risk. So they want to know where the costs are going, where it's being spent. Um, They want to be able to look at things like what's the financial performance in this employee health plan, um, really sort of from a business perspective. And the goal there is really to improve spend or improve the dollars. When you think about it clinically, you really look at it in a slightly different lens. You're using different data sources to really say, where are the best opportunities for us to improve the health status of this population? Where can we close care gaps? Um, and both things tend to be important, and, and specifically um, when you're focusing on a, any value-based plan, really bringing these two capabilities together, um, which, which involve different types of risk stratification and analytics, um, becomes sort of that, that sweet spot. It's, um, I want to know patients who are both 
valuable from a dollars and cents health plan perspective, um, but who also um, have been flagged for things like avoidable admissions, because that's where I'm going to spend my time. I know that these are things that we can do in this plan that will likely result in the patients being healthier and the dollars being lower. Um, and just to share with you just a couple quick examples. So this is an example of a, an analytic graph or a dashboard that an office manager, uh, a care team, a physician might even use that answers those two questions. Tell me patients in a certain health plan who are going to be predicted to spend money in the plan year, but who also have avoidable admissions. In this case, we're using um, big data in two ways. Um, it's, it's, it's overlaid. So we're looking at a claims-based predictive model that says patients uh, in this graph are likely to spend money in this plan year. And these patients are also likely to have future admissions in the next six months related to CHF. And anybody that has a green bar is actually isolated they have not had any admission yet. So um, this is sort of a down and dirty, quick real world example. Uh, another quick example takes you sort of a little higher up. This gives you some information on you know, what the employees look like from that employer or narrow network. Shows risk factors, uh, three months, 12 months out, um, employees with certain high cost risk factors, uh, what uh, conditions are making up the top 50% of cost, um, and lots of other things as well. Here's just another quick example. The top left graph shows you that this employer has about 30,000 employees in the clinics they visit, and whether they're smokers or not. Um, this is just one example of a very high-level general, general question you could ask. The next one over says, of these 30,000 people, who are likely to spend money in the future 12 months, in the next 12 months. And so of the 30,000, I know it might be hard to see, there's about 1,300 patients there or employees there that are likely to spend dollars based on their previous claims history. And then the top right graph actually shows of the 1,300, there's the 1% 1 of the 1%, 400. And, and, and again, the green show where there are um, no dollars actually paid in the plan year. So if you think about we're looking for cost takeout opportunity, those are the patients we want to focus on. Um, and then what I've done at the bottom left um, is actually overlay the predictive model in CHF. So, um, you know, if you think about the cost takeout opportunity in that top right graph, um, the 1% of the 1%, you know, you don't necessarily know where that spend is going to occur unless you overlay some other models that look at other data. So um, we found that of the 400-some patients, um, about half of them actually have indication of future CHF admissions, and some of them are index admissions. The, in, the, the admission hasn't occurred. That's the green bar there. So these are just some real-world examples we thought we'd share uh, just to give you an idea of some analytics that folks are looking at. Um, to help this, but I think um, Dan um, and Julie have also shared a, a slide similar to this, and you know I think a lot of organizations are really focusing on using their data to um, improve the process design of their care delivery, and you know they're really sort of looking at you know where do we focus, what insight do we have, which patients do we look at, what tools like predictive modeling and big data and risk stratification which patients are valuable to focus on. And once we found that, what actions are we going to take? Um, are we going to put them into care coordination? Are we going to outreach to them? What ways? Measurement of the, um, the previous two is really important because you want to you create a system again where you can find out what's working. So to be able to look and say, we identified these patients, we did this with them, and this is what works, um, helps drive that, that that continual improvement and continual moving the needle. So with that, um, I will conclude and, and turn it back to Don. Okay, thanks to each of you. Um, and if the audience does have any questions, uh, please feel free to um, send them in um, to the chat box to the left. Uh, simply type in your message. 
And as it says there, if you have a question for a specific presenter, uh, please go ahead and uh, insert his or her name uh, next to your question, uh, and we'll try to get to those. We will give just a few minutes for questions to come in. Uh, if not, we will have a couple questions that help drive the uh, conclusion of this um, webinar presentation. I think what we'll go ahead and do is go ahead and open up a couple of these questions. Um, Julie, Dan, or Ryan, if one of you wants to jump in, um, that would be greatly appreciated. But let's look at the first bullet point here and kind of just how can employers aid in providing access to health information to help uh, decrease health care expenditures? Well, Don, this is Julie, and I, I would uh, kick off a response to that question by saying I think employers stand in a great position to create a culture of health within a work setting. So, um, you know, many employers do some kind of health risk assessment. Just by asking those questions, you already start to provide access to health information because you you start to tickle people's interest and in why are we asking that question. Um, you know, I think Dan's example of his own weight, when you, when you learn about weight and are able to see how you fit in on a scale and then an employer can provide information about healthy eating, active living, and then an employer can provide opportunities to make it easier to choose healthy foods and to be physically active at work. Um, and how they change their environment um, can be very, very useful. So you both raise awareness just by asking the questions, and then you keep reinforcing it by changes you make in the work setting. Everything from stand-up desks to walking breaks to standing meetings to walking meetings, all of those can be things that leaders in the organization lead on that then help really instill that culture of health. I was recently at an employer who has their own cafeteria, and they were doing several things in the cafeteria to help both provide health information and change the culture. For one thing, every ladle or every label of a food in the cafeteria was coded green, yellow, or red based on the calorie and fat content of that food. And believe me, when you were at the salad bar, when there was a red ladle for your salad dressing or a green ladle, you were a lot more inclined to pick the green ladle. Um, another thing they were doing in that cafeteria was they were charging prices differently. So the salad bar was much less expensive than if you went to the grill and got a cheeseburger and french fries. And so that's called competitive food prices, um, pricing, where you price the healthier food lower um, and the unhealthier food higher. So um, just a few examples of ways I think uh, employers can, can be part of creating a culture of health by providing information and changes in the environment for their employees. Don, it's Dan, and I'll answer the first two questions together, uh, given the experiences that I've had both in Illinois and when I was with Cigna, in Atlanta, and that is employers can begin to change their benefit design. They can also somewhat get into the provider business. If you're large enough, you can sponsor an on-site clinic and build your benefit designs to drive your, your employees and their beneficiaries into the clinic. 
If you're not as large, you can go into a shared clinic model. The other thing that you can do is working with health systems as a admit as a self insured employer have whoever is handling your claims payment, whether that's an insurance company or a third party administrator, provide the health information based on the claims to the local health system so that they have much better access to good information than they would normally have because now they can see the pharmaceuticals that were prescriptions that were filled and not just ordered by the physician that the doctors can get out of the medical record so they can start to close gaps in care because they may be writing the appropriate prescriptions, but if they're not filled, they don't do any good. They can start to see healthcare services rendered outside their own system so that they can re reach out to their patients and redirect them back into the system to help better manage the population health. Uh, we're starting to see some really innovative things going on. You may have read in Seattle that Boeing has started to contract directly with health systems for both quality purposes as well as cost. And that one's made the national news, but those endeavors by large employers are starting to happen across the country. And we're starting to see more and more of that. It did start out little a few years ago when select companies would contract with nationally renowned centers for certain services, mostly cardiac related. So changing your benefit designs to reward those who have a healthier lifestyle, whose weight's appropriate, and if your weight's not appropriate, providing incentives to lose weight, as well as the appropriate coaching and making it mandatory that you take that if you want to, if you have, for example, um, the, the types of benefit designs where this is appropriate to, uh, in, to help people to utilize those services and to steer patients, their employees, and their dependents to those healthcare providers where the quality outcomes are the best and the costs as a result seem to be better under control. A couple of examples there. Hey, this is Ryan. I'll just add um, at a high level, you know, I think um, we're starting to see it. Dan mentioned a couple of examples where employers and health systems are, are working more together. But I think opening up communication between employers and their providers in town um, will illuminate a whole host of opportunities. I think when you look at what everybody's trying to do, and an employer wants healthier employees um, for all the right reasons and health systems um, want to make patients healthier and, and they, they, they want more um, patients as well. And when you think about just those two basic things, um, the opportunities for employers and providers to to team up in a joint mission is, is just wide open and there's lots of things going on. So I just think communicating more is a big thing. Thank you each for your response. I, uh, taking something from each of them, I, I do agree with whether it's education or incentives uh, or communication uh, and kind of the employer and the healthcare organization working as a team um, to keep the population healthy. But what kind of things, looking at that third bullet point, can organizations or healthcare organizations do to help hold the help the employer hold the employee accountable um, for competencies around their own health. Well, it's Dan. I'll start with this one, and I think it's not just healthcare organizations, but payers. If you work in a combination, work work looking at the benefit design and providing the services to a assist people to change unhealthy behaviors, to lose weight, to stop smoking, to get more exercise, uh, to eat right, even if they don't lose the weight. Eating healthier does help. And healthcare organizations have a lot of that expertise. We don't get it out there. 
We don't do a lot of outreach. We wait for the patient to come to us and try and do it at an individual level. That's been the history and tradition, and we've not developed the programs yet to reach out into the community at the employer level and to provide some of those services to the employer to make them readily available. We've defaulted to the insurance companies who also have their own versions of these services but we've never tried to coordinate their utilization and to provide them in a face-to-face -face setting versus telephonically or over the Internet, which is how the insurance companies end up doing it, just because of the sheer size of the endeavor for them. We're the local entity and the local provider, so we can provide a lot of services face-to-face, -face, but it's coordinating that with the payer so that we can afford to provide those services which are not traditionally reimbursed type services. And I'll stop there for the others to comment. And this is Julie. I think um, as I think about how can healthcare organizations and employers work with employees to help them be more accountable for their own health care, I think you know many of the topics we've discussed here in terms of benefit design can put more accountability on the individual and their family. I think one of the challenges <clears throat> that I often hear from employers is when they think about their health care costs, um, the bigger portion of health care costs can be in the people who are not in their work site every day. They, they can be in the, the spouses and the children, uh, the dependents of that employee. So I think there are ways in plan design that can put more uh, accountability with the person and their family. I also think, again, going back to how do we um, create communities where people, where the norm becomes healthiness. Um, I know, you know, I have been in healthcare for over 30 years, and when I was a new practicing nurse in 1982, I used to walk into patients' rooms who had just had surgery for lung cancer or voice box cancer and turn off the oxygen in their room so they could smoke a cigarette in their bed in the hospital room. And in 1982, when I used to say to my peers, this is crazy making, why are we supporting people, in fact, enabling people to smoke in the hospital, everybody said, because that's the way it is and we can't do it any differently. Well, clearly, in 30 short years, <laughs> we have made that change. And now when I tell that story to new nurses, they look at me like I'm a dinosaur, that people ever smoked in hospitals. And I suspect there will be a day children will grow up in this country and never see anybody smoking in a restaurant, in a bar, in a park, in a ball field, or anywhere. So we have made that change or are in the process of making a dramatic change in how we think about smoking. And I think we have that same opportunity in how we build communities that make it easier to walk and bike, how we build offices that make it easier to move how we change food and make healthy food easier and more affordable for people. So I think there's that balance, holding people accountable, but also creating environments where making those healthy choices, the easy choice, is prevalent. Yeah, I'll add that um, healthcare organizations, um, hospitals, providers, um, even uh, Healthcare IT companies, um, you know, we're we're all employers, and um, we all do things to our own employees um, that promote um, wellness, and um, and there's lots of strategies and tools and technologies, and and you know, a lot of the healthcare systems in the country have their own uh, wellness and benefits departments, and you know, thinking about working with other employers, you know, part of that conversation has to be, you know, what have we done internally that's worked and, um, and and how can we have conversations with local employers that are mutually beneficial in our both best interests um, to um, to share some of the, the real world wins, technologies we've used. Um, and then lastly, what are some of the things that we can each bring to the table that can help each other? Uh, so, you know, if, if I'm an employer, um, and um, I'm interested in lowering the, the cost of my self-funded uh, employee health plan, 
you know, um, your local hospital system has a lot of very valuable data that uh, they can use that um, they can focus to on your on your patients and, and promote wellness, and, and that's just one piece of the puzzle. So, so again, sitting down and, and discussing the, the tools that each party can bring to the table, how they can use them, and um, creating a, a mutually beneficial uh, agreement, business plan to to work to promote health together. Um, that's in everybody's best interest, obviously. Great, thank you. Um, Dan, there's a question directed to you as mentioned in your mention to alternative models and um, the attendee thinking of a model in, of insurance in New York called the Oscar. Do, is there anything that you can speak to on that? I'm not familiar with Oscar, but I've actually hit the hyperlink to see if I can uh, check it out. Uh, unfortunately, it's not letting me go there. Uh, oh well, I tried. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your feedback. I, yeah. you know, I'd like to direct a, a comment to Julie, if I could, just kind of wrapping up with the last discussion point and kind of the challenges your organization experiences when try to implement a wellness program. But we're in a different marketplace as employers today. Um, in every industry where the days where a particular person puts in 30 years of service and you're managing their health throughout that is different. And, Julie, you had some good points in our earlier discussions about that, and I just wondered if you would hit on that for the audience. It does seem like we have lost Julie um, in her re ability to respond. Oh. So, sorry, Don. You didn't no, lose okay. me. I was just muted. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, no, that was my fault. I had muted myself so I wouldn't cough in anyone's ear. But um, going to your question, I think that whole phenomenon of people moving from employer to employer, I heard on uh, one of the morning news shows that we need to think about employees joining us for a tour of duty rather than a lifetime of work. And for that reason, I think it make, makes it even more imperative that we create a culture of health where all employers are working to create healthy environments and incentives for employees, and that together employers, healthcare organizations, government, and other community leaders are creating healthy communities because our employee pool is no longer just the people who are working for us today, but the other people in our community who may jump from one employer to another and people from other communities who may readily move from our community to the next. So that, that whole phenomenon of tours of duty, shorter duration of employment actually, I think, increases um, the responsibility we have to each other to be doing this in each of our settings. It also um, gives us the opportunity to think about what are some of the shorter term opportunities we can do. I often think about women's health and, and issues related to pregnancy or prevention of pregnancy as really important um, factors that can help um, both help people plan families that they want to have and control health care costs in an organization to make sure that people are only having children when they would like to have children and when they are pregnant that they're getting good care and uh, good culture to support a healthy pregnancy so that their babies are not born too early. So, you know, that's one area where even with shorter terms of employment, we have a real opportunity to make effective um, implementation strategies. Well, thank you very much for your feedback. Uh, we'll stay on the line for one more minute just in case there are any remain, remaining questions uh, before we go ahead and conclude the webinar for today.
do see a question that did come in um, from Martin in Rockford. Any insights about what percent of U.S. Uh, community have um, community health care partnership, uh, such as the one in Cincinnati? Don, it's Dan. There were, I think, four Medicare demonstration projects that were, that I think is what they're referring to built. And I, I'm, I am familiar with the one in Cincinnati that happens to be my hometown. Um, but I don't recall where the others are. Uh, like I went over to Bethesda to look at it, who was one of the authors of that program. That was one of the alternative demonstration projects to uh, accountable care organizations, and the ACO model is the one that has been implemented more frequently. Well, thank you for your feedback, Dan. I think we'll use this time to go ahead and conclude the webinar for today. Um, so thanks to Julie and Dan and Ryan for their time. On behalf of the Central Illinois Chapter of the American College of Health Care Executives, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we will work to get slides out to all attendees as well as a, a YouTube link to today's presentation. But once again, thanks to everyone for attending, and please enjoy.